a lot. And by the way, I've turned around in the Midway Church parking lot twice. I know where that is. It's a fabulous spot, and Sunbury is amazing, and um, Midway is amazing. Darien is also another of those colonial towns. So please take a road trip down to Georgia and, and also into Florida and remember those that fought for us down there. Next, we have a new friend of mine. And we are working on a project together that is very exciting. But today he's going to talk about the conflicts of command with Peter Ori, Mr. Dave Newland. Okay, uh, I'm going to do a sound check. And is, yeah, is this loud enough, you guys, or we're not? No, okay. I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you whenever I start to read. <laughs> uh, first off, I have to make a, uh, a couple of statements first. First of all, uh, this talk this afternoon uh, originated from a conversation that I had had with Carol and George Summers. So I must say that this is we look a, a little bit for George today too. Uh, uh, second, secondly, it's a little uh, speaking of a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, I had a stroke a couple of years ago, so I may not speak as animated as you might might uh, want. Or also, also going to be reading because I don't feel like stumble over too long. So reading, I'll stumble a little bit, but hopefully it'll be easier for you all to uh, understand what I'm talking about. So, with that said, let me say this. Uh, Peter O'Ree. You would not think that a guy like Peter O'Ree would get caught up in so much turmoil. It seems like every time he turned around, every time he tried, every time he said and did anything, it just turned out wrong. As a related response to my ancestors, frustration, that being Peter O'Ree, Herewith is a litany of experiences that try his patience. My intention here is to simply narrate his relationships with Francis Marion, Benjamin Lincoln, Nathaniel Green, John Rutledge, and Hezekiah Mann, starting in 1780 through 1782. Originally entitled Conflicts in Command, you will uh, maybe agree with me that it may be more aptly called confusion in command. years, Peter O'Ree served with Francis Marion in the 2nd South Carolina Regiment. He was promoted Lieutenant Colonel Commandant of the 5th, 5th Regiment in 1779, the same rank as Francis Marion. Now, stay with me on this crossover of O'Ree's military and personal life. O'Ree's regiment was disbanded following the disastrous defeat in Savannah in October 79. After the resulting reorganization of the South Carolina regiments, General Lincoln sent O'Ree on furlough based on his seniority. State uh, Lieutenant Colonel Williams, William Henderson, instead of O'Ree, was to command the new 3rd Regiment. Then, for some reason, Henderson did not accept his, the assignment. Meanwhile, back in Georgetown, O'Ree was courting, he hoped, Miss Mary Mann. And that name comes to, to the current, despite as an aside, as Mansfield Plantation. And Miss Mary Mann had, had been, the, at some point, the owner of that current uh, plantation. Lincoln, 
then recalled O'Ree to physician Anderson rejected. Lincoln's aide, Major Hedman Earn, wrote February 11, 1780, you are this day in orders for third regiment as commander and the general desires that your presence is immediately and absolutely necessary. We have certain intelligence of British troops having landed and we are just informed that 47 sail are now off stone. The siege of Charleston has begun. O'Ree wrote Miss Mann February 13th. Notwithstanding the return of my letter, apparently his courting efforts were not possible. <laughs> By express from General Lincoln, received information, urgent terms require my attendance. In defense of my country, I now only to entreat you to believe that if ever I survive this impending storm, nothing will satisfy me better than being approved of by you. O'Ree headed for Charleston. Major Hearn intercepted O'Ree on the road and informed him that Henderson had decided to accept the position after all. Hearn wrote February 11th. Now we know that Ori has just been named to be the new commander, and they later, a day later, Ori, uh, excuse me, Ern wrote, "I am sorry to have troubled you with my letter of this date by the express." Colonel Henderson, before the order was issued, informed the general that he had altered his mind and would accept the appointment. So he's been he's been hired, and now he gets fired. <laughs> Crestfallen. O'Ree returned to Georgetown. Fortunately, he was absent from the fall of Charlestown in May 1780. And as a side, Miss Mann and O'Ree did not marry. Yeah. Not over yet, please. After the fall of Charlestown, O'Ree migrated to North Carolina. He reunited with Marion at General Osrio, uh, Horatio Gates Camp. The two left Gates the day before the tobacco at Camden, August 16th. Marion, with Ori as second in command, organized the militia in the area between the PD and the Santee. They were very successful, deviling the loyalists at numerous actions, including the Bridges Campaign and the Siege of Fort Watson. In April 1781, the issue of the, the reversal of Horry's promotion in 1780 by Lincoln here is head. Remember, Horry was hired and fired. On April 20, Horry wrote a letter of grievance to General Green. It is uncertain whether Horry sent the letter. However, the issue remained unresolved. In late June, General Green and Governor Rutledge came up with a plan to create two state regiments, each composed of cavalry and infantry. Peter O'Ree and Ezekiah Mann were named commanders. In less than a month, a conflict arose. O'Ree outlined how Mann had challenged O'Ree's right to command. O'Ree had been ordered by Thomas Sumter to take command of several regiments, among which was Colonel Mayans. This gentleman desired in sight of my Continental Cavalry's commission and finding his own commission to be the same day, disputed my commanding him. Green replied to Ori, I cannot conceive Colonel Mayan serious in his claim of rank as he most undoubtedly knew that you bore a commission superior to his. I doubt not that Colonel Mayhem will readily yield to you. Mayhem did not yield, but the issue went on the back burner. At that time, O'Ree's leadership became the focus of intense criticism. Governor Rutledge had revised regulations regarding militia duty. On September 23, 
Marion wrote, O Reed, I am informed that you or some of your officers have ordered a tar kiln to be set on fire to make coals for your workmen. If I find it true, that gentleman shall be immediately put under arrest and tried by a general court martial. I am informed a great number of men, all of them not doing the service of one third. Hori was ignorant of the new militia regulations. In frustration, he wrote Marion on August 5. I am sorry for such orders and believe there must be some mistake, as I do not suppose your intentions can be to prevent me my equipping my men in the field which must be the case if you debar my employing workmen. To make matters worse, O'Reilly received a scorching criticism from Rutledge October 10th. General Marion informs me that some of your officers have behaved very much amiss in impressing plow horses. Not only was O'Reilly severely criticized for how horses were impressed, but he also came under fire for his method, such as accepting substitutes and, and uh, recruiting men for his cavalry. Only six weeks earlier, Gen General Green had approved accepting substitutes. O'Reed was certainly frustrated. Rutledge rebuked O'Reed for the use of substitutes, notifying him, I have revoked the order to the brigadier of militia with respect to those who furnish men or money which procured them for your regiment. Finally, on October 23, Green recognized the unmanageable situation. He informed O'Reed to put yourself and corps under the command of General Marion. Green informed Mayhem on the same day. <coughs> that week later, he thoroughly exasperated Peter O'Reed responded to three Rutledge letters he had just received. In response, O'Ree asserted that he was unable to organize his regiment. He could not enlist men for any less than three years. He could not accept substitutes. He could not recruit cavalry, exempting a militia from duty for trifling sums. <coughs> After defending his actions to Rutledge, he presented his case to Green. Agreeably to your orders, I have put myself and corps under General Marion's command. I used to submit to General Marion's orders with pleasure. But at present, I assure you, it is disagreeable to me, it has drawn two letters from the governor to me, which are such reprimand like I never in near seven years service <coughs> experience. I know number four, after learning that Marion had received inaccurate information, Rutledge responded to O'Reilly's defense, empathizing with him. Rutledge wrote, I am exceeding sorry for the misunderstanding that seems to have taken place between General Mary and you. I cannot suppose that his complaints of your officer conduct were ill-founded. Doubt not that General Marion will be convinced that he has been misinformed. Now don't forget, we have, we have a war going here, just, just as an aside. I know it's not necessarily that important about what's going on here, but there was a war going on. O'Ree wrote to Green November 8th, I assure you, I am truly sensible of General Marion's merits, but when I found myself in officers by him and the governor, <coughs> censured my General Marion's desire, I have since I wrote you, waited on him, and I think we are now both satisfied. The rift between O'Ree and Marion apparently was repaired. Just in time for the next brouhaha, uh -huh. the powder keg sparked in the stand up. General Marion had been elected to the Senate. The legislature was to convene January 8, 1782 in Jacksonburg. 30 miles from Charlestown. Since he would be ascent, attend, <clears throat> me, since he was the absent attending to the business of the Senate, Marion took the logical steps that 
delegating his authority. He still had commands of both the Hillary and Ham regiments. But remember, back in July, Mann had refused to accept Overy's authority because they had the commission date in the same day. When the issue of rank again surfaced six months later, Marion was quickly to confront both commanders. The entry in his January 7 order book is appointed. Colonel Owees and Mayhem will come to my quarters tomorrow to settle the rank of their respective regiments and officers. That should take care of it. And it was pretty, pretty clear to me. And, but it wasn't that, of course. I did not think Colonel Mayhem could possibly contest any longer to commit him. Ori continued informing Green that during the meeting between Marion, Mann, and Ori, Ori wrote, your letter was produced by the Colonel Mann would not accede to General Marion's opinion or your letter. Your letter was produced but the Colonel Mann would not accede to Marion's opinion or your letter. Okay. Green wrote directly to Mann on January 17 to clarify the situation. Again, Green did not explicitly, in this letter, tell Mann and the Ori outranged him. This, 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 this is bizarre to me to talk the situation. Ori's letter further stoked the fire between the two officers. He wrote Mann two days later that per General Marion, O'Ree was to command of your legion, that's man's legion, if I find it necessary. If I find it necessary, I being O'Ree. Man was quick to respond to O'Ree's request. His January 20 letter to O'Ree was also enclosed in Marion's letter to Green of January 26. And he, he wrote, this, this was man. I received letters yesterday from General Green and Marion. Neither of them has wrote to me on the subject of giving you the rank. There, I therefore do not think of giving up the rank to you. If your commission was of an other date than mine, I would readily have submitted it. But as the matter stands, you may rely on it that I never shall, as to my part, cannot see what right you have to expect to take the rank. That's man right there. He's, he's ticked off about it. <laughs> Gave us. Okay. Ironically, Marion apparently did not follow up the man. So we have we have Green not being explicit. And now we have Marion uh, apparently not to follow up with man to clarify the chain of command. The sticking point for man was that. Since Marion would be away attending the legislature, O'Ri would, in effect, become Mayhem's commanding officer. I don't think so. I don't, Mayhem was not going to do that. Mayhem lost no time in firing off a second letter. He blatantly threatened his fellow commander. These guys are, are lieutenant colonels, by the way. You mentioned in your yours that you would not take any advantage of me. I would not advise you to attempt any such thing for fear you may fail in the attempt. Is that a, is that a threat or what? O'Ree's letter, January 31 to Marion, provided enough ammunition to court martial 10 men. It's a, it's a very long letter. Uh, and O'Ree described too many complaints to include in this presentation, but uh, uh, condensed below is the gist of O'Ree's disgust. I assure you, your presence is much wanted here. It is impossible for me to comply with your orders in covering this part of the country. Colonel Mann interferes with my command so much that I can scarcely act. Your brigade lessens daily. I assure you, my patience is near exhausted, and it is just 
possible, you can leave the house. The command here awaits your presence. Tomorrow I shall hear further of man's conduct and of the person at Mrs. Bo Reeves, and I shall send you another express. Green kept trying to put an end to the dispute, expressing his surprise that even after he had explained to Mam multiple times, Mam still disputed. Green wrote, in settling matters of rank, regard has always been paid to their more, former standing, except in the case of voluntary resurrection. Once again, that's free, uh, free, uh, clear. Mayhem had been elected to the legislature. Because his regiment would, would be without leadership, he decided not to attend. Then, Mayhem changed his mind because he would not take a chance that he would be subjugated to overeating his port. Instead, Mayhem attended the legislature. And meanwhile, Overeem became so ill that he left his command to recuperate at a Georgetown plantation. So with neither O'Ree nor Mayhem in command, the loyalists routed the patrons at Wamba Bridge on February 24. The next day, the loyalists again routed the patrons, patriots at Tyman's plantation, despite merit. As a result, the regiments of O'Ree and Mayhem were decimated. Marion recommended consolidation of two regiments to Governor John Matthews. Green approved and felt Marion should choose the commander of the new regiment. That was a chicken move, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> After a month of procrastinating, Green dropped the bomb. On March 27th, I recommended to General Marion to continue which officer he might would be most useful. I do not pretend to judge between you and Colonel Mayhem. General Marion thinks Mayhem is better qualified for the cavalry service than you are. And that's from Green. Marion backed up. I did propose to General Green and the governor to incorporate the two regiments, but did not say which the two officers would be prefer. I think what I said was nearly this, that Colonel Mann was the best cavalry officer and you was the best infantry, and proposed that your corps should be dismounted and serve as infantry in Georgetown. This, I thought, consulted the good of the service without throwing you out of service. Very political answer. Just when the cavalry consolidation issue looked like it was settling down, a new wrinkle approved, appears. A man who was in poor health took leave to his plantation. While there, he was captured by Loyalist May 16. With man out of the picture, the O'Ree man dispute abruptly ended. Now, on that subject, there's no further discussion about uh, O'Ree taking over the Calvary, the, 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 the remaining regiment. We think that uh, since this, if a man is out of the picture, then O'Ree should be logically, he would logically become the new regiment commander. Not, it's not mentioned anywhere, anywhere. But then, as Yogi Bear said, it's not over until it's over. Yes, man was out of the picture, but about this time, Ori again brought up his promotion, then not promotion, dating back to January 1780 with General Lee. I'm sure all of you guys remember all this stuff together. There was a test that way. I forgot to tell you all about it. Not, not, not one oh, about about me because I I can't remember this. Stuff. There was talk of recording, uh, reorganizing Sumter's militia brigade and promoting William, <clears throat> William Henderson as a brigadier of the militia. Henderson was then a, a continental lieutenant colonel on Green's staff. 
the latest and on and off again issue. Where are you? I think lost you now, sir. Uh, Green informed a read via Marion about the situation. Marion laid it out for Ori. If Colonel William Henderson is made a brigadier in the militia, probably he will give up his rank in the first regiment, as Colonel Ori has some pretensions to be retained in service. Before him, when he first, when the first arrangement took place back in 1780, under General, uh, this was under General. Benjamin Lincoln, which he told me some time ago, you made acquainted with. And that is, this is sent, uh, written to Green. Regarding the potential for O'Ree taking of Anderson's regiment, O'Ree, however, Green's analysis was not favorable. Whatever right Colonel O'Ree had upon it, any former claim shall be attended to whenever any investigation of his claims can be had, or he is ready to attend to the matter. Had Henderson resigned his Continental Commission when he promoted, promoted to Brigadier General of the South Carolina Militia, O'Ree would have been a legitimate candidate for the position of Henderson vacated. O'Ree reminded Green of former communication in which O'Ree related how General Lincoln passed over him in 1780 how Green promised to reward O'Ree for his past service. After a few days passed, on March 25, O'Ree revised his, his request. He acknowledged that he would not be tapped to command a new South Carolina Continental Infantry Regiment. He had already given up on, on the militia command. And uh, O'Ree wrote, as I was Lieutenant Colonel Commandant about two years and a half ago, I think my rank ought to be preserved to me, and his explanation that the governor, nor yourself, would expect me to act in an inferior station. On, on April 2, Green offered to open an investigation to hear O'Ree's claims. O'Ree bemoaned as to an investigation of my claim to be transmitted to the Minister of War it is little worth such trouble. The past treatment of my country to me has never encouraged my service or even given me my just dues. Therefore, I have no great ambition to persevere in her ill treatment, although she is hardly welcome in what is past. As a final blow, Green acknowledged the findings would be forwarded to the Minister of War for a final decision. Ironically, Benjamin Lincoln, remember him from 1780? This Minister of War, the same Lincoln, had promoted Anderson two years, two years earlier. So obviously, O'Ree realized there was nowhere to go with this one. This is a dead, dead issue. O'Ree informed Green on January 20 that Marion's approval, he had turned over command of the 16 remaining dragoons in his regiment. And a rejoinder, O'Ree would have to retire unless Green or Matthews order otherwise. Either had duty for him, he would, he would need new powers or new commissions. Green wrote back, at present, I have no commands which will interfere with your wishes for retirement. <laughs> Game of an out there, didn't he? Yeah. Green concluded, I sincerely thank you for your polite attention to all my wishes and for the very essential service which you have rendered the public and me in the arduous struggle. Now, how many people do you think Green wrote that to his former officer? Look pretty mad in this one. I mean, this is probably the same guy after he got his uh, last letter. Wham! After seven trying years, O'Ree returned to the life of uh, planner in the Fort Georgetown area. O'Ree wrote a biography of Francis Marion, passing it, passing it on to Reverend Mason Locke Weems. 
and transformed it into an historical romance. <laughs> Peter O. Reed held his commission in the South Carolina militia, attained the rank of Brigadier General. In 1784, 148 citizens of Georgetown sent a letter writing to General Francis Marion. We, citizens and freemen of the district of Georgetown, convey to you our grateful sentiments for your former numerous services, not forgetful of that general by whose prudent conduct their lives have been saved and their families preserved for being plundered by a rapacious enemy. Peter O. Reed was the first signer of that letter. O. Reed went on to become a member of the South Carolina Senate and House of Representatives. General Peter O. Reed died in 1815 at the age of 72. Amen. It's clear. There are a couple of items to add to the confusion that David described so eloquently and so greatly. It's a great presentation, and it's all 100% there except for a few things. Just a quick note, in April of 1781, Sumter and Marion were Brigadier Generals of South Carolina Militia. Okay? Not Continentals anymore. They still held their Continental Commission, but they were head of of the militia. In April of 81, Sumter was authorized five state regiments of dragoons and infantry. So these men were, were now considered on the state payroll, not just militia. So now Sumter had militia and state troops. Marion and his men were ticked. They didn't have state troops, they were just militia. So Marion's of, of, he, he fought for the whole spring and summer to get some more state troops. So finally, in October of 1781, he was authorized two regiments of state troops under his command. One, Hezekiah Mayhem, one, Peter Ori. What really caused all the confusion was that at the time, Mayhem was a major. He had just recently been promoted to lieutenant colonel in, in militia, but Ori was lieutenant colonel in Continental, but he was also lieutenant colonel in militia. In October, they were given commands of two regiments of state troops, and guess what? Mayhem got the first number. He was the third, and Ori was the fourth regiment. And that's what ticked Ori off. <laughs> May it was a third, he was the fourth, and then, you know, he, he couldn't prove, he couldn't scream that he had been slighted except for the fact of dates of service. And all the stuff I just mentioned about May only being a militia major, two other typicals, all that. Well, after Tidyman and, and Wambo, Ori's regiment was decimated. And so they combined it all under Mayhem, and then Mayhem got captured. Well, you mentioned that there's no mention of what happened after that. Daniel Conyers took over Mayhem's regiment, not Ori. Daniel Conyers was a major under Mayhem, and so he took it over for the remainder of the war. But from, from March of 82 on, there wasn't a lot of action. So again, Ori was offered Commandant of Georgetown, but he said, eh, don't need it, adios. And so that's been part of the conflict that, that a lot of people fail to understand is that the, the state troop issue versus militia. Just let that happen.
battle skirmishes, et cetera, et cetera. And, and obviously, as the two of you have explained, there was this issue of are you part of the Continental Army, are you part of the militia, are you part of the, part of the state um, command structure? But is well from from my understanding, he was still quite active. Peter Orby was quite active in many of the battles. Um, acting under some authority or <laughs> acting as a volunteer or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, I will read. Yeah, we're talking about in June and July of 1782. There's nothing going on that Ori would even be involved with at that time. He was involved with the the, uh, the settling of the truce with, with Ganey and uh, the Patriots that Ori was to be the leader of in the Patriots side since he had done the same thing the previous year on the truce with Ganey. But when 1782, Ori got sick again. So he would not be at that truce meeting with, with Ganey and the loyalists. So, and other than that, that was pretty much that was the end of Ori's activities at all. He may have he returned to uh, Georgetown area, probably his, his plantation, so he may have done something a little bit in Georgetown in the management of, of, the, of the town, but in activity he was not really uh, participating much of anything. After the summer of 1782, the Big British were bottled up in Charleston, and they were only sending out foraging units to, to go get food or what have you. There little skirmishes here, there, or whatever, but or he was out of the picture by then. He was out of Else? Guess what? I'll be here for the rest of the day and all day long. And I live in Horry County. <laughs> hey, thank you. As a military wife of 24 years, I can tell you that, that sounded just like something that my husband would have come home with, right? Oh my gosh. That's what's been so amazing to me learning about the Rogue War is the these people are fighting, but yet there's this epistle war going on, and they're, they're just having these conversations, and it's amazing to me. Very, very human. Thank y'all for today. Please make sure that you uh, visit the um, museum here in Manning. It's fantastic. Take a drive by the murals. Um, but please be back here. I'm going to tell you, like a good mom, 545. We're kicking off right at 6 o'clock for dinner. I love it. You're on my... He's winning a prize. Uh, make sure you visit the vendors. And are there any goals?